Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming back to another show. The nonprofit show is here every Friday with our friends at Fundraising Academy to answer your questions. Now, LaShonda, you know, because this probably happened to you, but people tweet us, they email us. They stopped me on the street. I had somebody stop me on a plane once and ask, could you, you know, address this question? Um, it's a really interesting thing. And so we are so excited to have you on today. We get a different voice and a different perspective from uh, Fundraising Academy each Friday. And LaShonda Williams comes to us from the great state of Texas. And so are you ready, my friend? We're going to thank our sponsors more importantly, I want you to be able to reach out to LaShonda and her team at fundraising-academy.org where you can learn more about all of their projects. And at the end of the show, we're going to talk about a really interesting conference that they have coming up, which I heard there's only like a, about 20 tickets left. You are right spot on. We have like right at 20. So Cultivate is definitely catching storm and things are moving very swiftly. So if anyone is out there interested in coming, do not delay because you may possibly miss the opportunity that you've been waiting for. I can't believe it. I, I was on a, a meeting with your team leaders earlier in the week and they they said, wow, you know, it's going, we're going to sell out. And I'm like, oh yeah, you'll sell out. And they're like, no, like in the next week or two. I'm like, what? Exactly. And we're like six, eight weeks away. So yeah. yes, exactly. Very exciting. Well, the nonprofit show will be there and we'll talk about that a little bit more. We are here today and every day, thanks to our amazing partners and sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, you can get to us in many ways through our app, through our streaming, through our podcasts, and through our live shows. But what's really interesting about this is that the archives for all these questions go back from the very beginning. And so there's a lot there that you can find with us. And we're going to jump right in because, you know, LaShonda, I get all excited when I have a name withheld, city withheld. <laughs> it's always a little juicy. Okay, this is a really interesting thing. This person writes in, I'm writing a book that shares my insights into what it looks like to be a fundraiser in the nonprofit space. I'm doing this to point out the negative aspects of being in cause selling or mission sales. As the way I see it, the customer is always right mindset is being used in nonprofit development. Do you think this is true? Very interesting Very. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like a... Right. You know, I, I see uh, fireworks, but in a different kind of way. So I will say um, first, you know, I'm curious to know why you would like to share the negative aspects of fundraising, because when I think about fundraising, the first three letters are F-U-N, fun. Mm -hmm. And so fundraising, most people enter that space um, because they want to make a difference. And although sometimes we may have less than favorable experiences, um, the outcome, the impact, are the things that are what really kind of drives most of us, but not necessarily all of us. So that's the first part of, of my response. The second part is there are mechanisms in place that do actually provide support for um, fundraisers. So for example, I'm certain that, you know, everyone in the nonprofit space is aware of the donor bill of rights. And they're like, well, what about the fundraisers? Well, you know, I can recall specifically, there was a chapter that was either St. Louis or Chicago. I can't remember which, but they came up with a draft of uh, something comparable to the donor bill of rights, which would address fundraisers um, rights. Uh, and so AFP had been working on some things um, to create opportunity space and some leveling of the playing field so that everyone feels as though they are equally valued. Um, and I would also say that from a being a professional in the industry, I've had the pleasure and benefit of working with individuals in leadership who also think about the employees and we reemphasize the importance of ethical behavior. And a part of that 
is making sure that in the event that your nonprofit professional is feeling like they are being um, infringed upon or asked something un unethical or if they are being um, harassed, you know, the same attributes of sexual harassment in the workplace are applicable in the nonprofit space when you're engaging with a donor. So I would say wow. um, that there are mechanisms available and your mindset is thinking about some of the best business practices are also applicable in the nonprofit space, yeah. especially when you're thinking about HR related concerns um, as it relates to rights. And so my experience, I can only go off of my experience, has been one that's been favorable and supportive. And I, I feel really, really sad that unfortunately this individual may have had a bad experience or had bad experiences. But when you're thinking about um, human resource concerns, they are applicable to those in the nonprofit space as well. You know, LaShonda, I love, I always, I always love your mindset because I think you're so empowered um, through and towards positivity. I mean, for the number of years we've worked with you, I really admire that. And I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, and I agree. It seems like this person might have really had some negative things that has change their point of view about the whole process and, and everything. And that that's, that's real. And that's not shameful, but I've got to ask this question. Have you ever been in an, in an environment where the, the, I almost want to use the word toxic, that the relationship with the donor became so toxic that you and your team or your organization, in essence, refunded their money and, and closed that door and said, we're not the right fit for you. I, I God, I've quoted Terry Axelrod um, twice this week, the, the, the woman who started raise, raising more money and, and then ultimately became Benavon. And she has this phrase called bless and release, meaning mm. thank you and go forward and do great things. They're just not going to be with us. Have you ever been in that environment? So I have been very fortunate that it's not escalated to that particular point. And so a part of uh, a part of the donor cycle, you know, is beginning to think about, you know, in, in the first part of the cost selling cycle as well, you're thinking about the pre-qualification and you're doing all of this background research on your prospective donor. And so we've been fortunate to be able to be preventive. And to identify early on if there were some questions about whether or not this relationship was a good relationship. Mm -hmm. And so an example that I will bring out um, about a decade ago with another institution, they had accepted some funds from a particular donor who later um, had been accused and prosecuted of a crime and they refunded those dollars. So, I mean, that does happen. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I've not been in a situation like that because we've, you know, been preemptive and done due diligence on the front end to ensure that, you know, if someone's going to make a sizable gift, that that person, um, those funds are le are made legally and that they're not in conflict with the organization's mission goal objectives and also ensuring that it will continue to create opportunities for subsequent gifts. You know, that it's it's supportive, that linkage, ability and interest is very important in making sure that there are no ethical implications of receiving that gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's I, where the gift acceptance policy comes into play as well. Looking at that, you know, when you're thinking right. about those attributes. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I know that at AFP coming up in Toronto, which you will be there with uh, the Fundraising Academy team. Uh, Jack Galato and Angela Barnes are going to be doing a seminar on, you know, kind of touching on the topics of, of how fundraisers are existing and, and what they, what are, I don't want to say the negatives, but what some of the challenges are. I am assuming some of these con conversations will come up um, because I think you're right about this. We don't really talk about it. And we don't really always have a strategy. And I think there are a lot of nonprofits that don't even have a gift acceptance policy. Like we won't take um, money from companies that sell alcohol or exactly or, or tobacco or firearms or I mean, no matter what whatever it is you do, it's a it, it's not a it's not a across the board. But you know what I mean, right? Um, so it's just kind of an interesting thing that 
we need to kind of take a breath and and look at these things. So thank you. Definitely. Amanda. Yeah. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Okay. Here's another name withheld. And I'm going to man up and say, or woman up, uh, that I took the name off because Sacramento is kind of a small. <laughs> so I didn't want to, I didn't want to out somebody. So the question is this, LaShonda, I'm leaving the for-profit space for a job in nonprofit fundraising. I'm used to earning commissions. I just learned that the nonprofit organization I am joining does not do this. Is this a normal thing in the nonprofit sector? That is another great question, Julia. And I'm so glad that you withheld the name yeah. <laughs> for that yes. particular individual. Uh, so I will go back to the why. Mm -hmm. So many individuals, not everyone, I know this is a very generic statement, enter the nonprofit space because you want to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. um, there are some opportunities to uh, secure and, and live well in specific positions in specific areas. However, most people enter just in the spirit of, I want to make the world a better place and I will be able to secure funding beyond what my capacity would be if I could make a donation to an organization. And so I'll just go from my, my vantage point. And so with that, you know, there's a big difference um, in nonprofit and depending on the type of nonprofit, but specifically as it relates to bonuses to answer your question more directly, AFP provides specific guidelines about the bonus process. And so with the bonus process, it is strictly based on, you know, what your salary is and it's based on your performance, not based on the amount of revenue that you've raised. You're not able to get commissions based off of referrals. Um, nonprofit is a business, but the model is a little bit different as it relates to the ethical implications. And the reason why I think it all exists is to ensure that our prospective donors know that we are vested in the organization and we're not looking at them as potential capital, but we're building a relationship with the individual to help amplify the mission of our organization, to amplify the impact of our organization. So what I will say, if this is a huge challenge for you now, you may want to have that conversation and ask perhaps there are mechanisms in place that you've not been made aware of, you know, should you meet your goal that perhaps you may be eligible for a promotion or perhaps there's merit pay incentives. And, you know, Julie and I, we've talked about that before. Uh, many organizations, depending on its structure, will offer merit pay based on performance evaluation. And that evaluation is not just specific to the fiscal um, uh, metrics that you are asked to achieve, but there are other variables involved. And we just want to make sure um, that we have clean lines and that your motivation is altruistic. You know, yes, we all want to live well, However, uh, we also want to make sure that our organizations continue to thrive and, and are able to sustain. Right. You know, I, and thank you for giving that um, overview, because what you everything you said is really the gold standard for our sector. And this is not new. I mean, this is a very tried and true approach that everybody pretty much understands, buys into, um, except for those who don't. And this was my concern when I read this question is that I felt, and I'd love your feedback on this. I felt that this person has, is, has a lot of missing links to the ecosystem of the nonprofit sector. And my question, I agree. are they ready to actually perform in this environment? Because this is such a basic thing that, I got to believe there are going to be other wackadoo things that we do in the nonprofit sector that is different from a for-profit sector that will just fritz them out or not allow them to be successful. So for me, I was just like, whoa, red flag, red flag, red flags, right? <laughs> You know, immediately I thought about what's your why? So why did you transition mm -hmm. from the yeah. for-profit space to the nonprofit space? Yeah. Because, you know, we don't enter the field because we're, we're looking to become millionaires. And I can remember how I was a volunteer for my alumni association for a good 10 plus years, uh, working on the board, doing fundraisers with my alumni association. 
for free as a volunteer for many, many years before I actually transitioned um, into a full-time position. So much so that my friends and family was like, well, do you work for them? I'm like, no, this is what I love to do, you know, with my free time. And I would constantly say, you know, if I do things that I enjoy, that the financial opportunity perhaps will come later. And I've always operated in that space so that I'm happy with the roles that I've accepted. And I've accepted them because of my connection to the organization and its mission, as opposed to what the compensation might be. Right. Well, you know, it is a, it's a, it's a profound question and I appreciate that it came in. Um, I have fear for this person because I don't know if this is going <coughs> to, pardon me, if this is going to work out for them. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I like to err on the side of optimism, yeah. but you know, if this is something that's, um, causing some challenges on the front end of yeah. the employment, I'm just afraid like you, that perhaps there will be some subsequent challenges along the way, adjusting to the nonprofit space, because we operate totally different, you know, right. with, with business, the bottom line is the number and, and people may not necessarily, um, be as forgiving in the business sector as they are in the nonprofit space. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, it's, it's fascinating and, and it'll be interesting to see if they, um, if they respond back to us or come back with, with other comments, cause it's, it's pretty intense. It, that that's an intense kind of in some ways, heartbreaking question. Okay. Matthew from Fort Lauderdale writes in, I'm starting to make more donors or I'm starting to take, excuse me, more donors out to lunch. And I need a better method for tracking and paying for these lunches. I am putting them on my own credit card and then waiting for reimbursement, which is costing me money and stress. Cash flow. <laughs> so that is a very great question. Yeah. So apparently they are, this individual, Matthew, I'm so sorry that you've not been given a company card um, to manage that. Uh, what I will suggest is um, having a conversation with, I think it's human resources or perhaps procurement office, which all kind of falls under that H line spectrum um, to discuss, you know, if the company, the organization, in fact, can secure a card that you can use or talk about what is a reasonable time frame for reimbursements. Because when you're talking about reimbursements on your credit card, there are a couple of implications there. One, depending on what your limit may or may not be, it could create some financial hardship for you and your family and your monthly budget. Um, depending on the timeline in which the reimbursement happens, you may be subject to interest rates. Yeah, And so those interest rates are things that you definitely will incur, which is punitive to you um, when you're acting on behalf of the organization. So mm -hmm. those are some serious um, conversations that you need to have with HR. And then the other suggestion, and it's not the best suggestion, okay? This is just an, a plan C, okay? <laughs> plan C. Plan C is to have a dedicated card that you use specifically for your organization. Um, and that way you don't mm -hmm. mix up the different um, accounting issues so that you can, you know, provide them with the full statement on that particular credit card. Yeah. And that way, you know, worst case scenario, perhaps they will, you know, pay the credit card company direct if you provide them with that full bill. So that way you can have it separate. Um, you can maintain great records, but I would start with asking them to secure a card. If they would not, if they're not up open to securing a card, then let's discuss what the reasonable time frame is for reimbursements. And, you know, in the nonprofit space, we talk about best practice. When we receive a gift, we'd like to get that acknowledgement letter in 72 hours. Yeah. So can I get my reimbursement in 72 hours yeah. <laughs> of submitting my receipt? So um, applying some of the things that we um, have in place for donors, you know, bring that to their attention that, you know, that's a really interesting way to do it. But again, plan C would be a separate credit card that you keep everything separate from, and then you provide them with all the information up front. Um, but do not incur um, any late fees if you can, or in the interest on that, because that can be very costly to you. Yeah, and it never goes away. I mean, it just it keeps never rolling. goes away. Forward. Yeah, the re rolling credit. Yeah, that, that yeah. becomes a challenge. And today's yeah. interest rates are really, really high. And yeah. so you don't want to put your family um, in a in a financial crunch. So have the conversation first and foremost, that's right. important. And I would add LaShonda, you know, you can go to virtually any supermarket 
and they will have kiosks or you know sections at the end of their aisles, what they call the end caps, where you can buy preloaded Visa cards or I'm a hundred percent there. You know, and and um, while it might not have the tracking and everything, at least your finance or accounting department can can do that because that's ridiculous. I mean, it is, and it's not. You know, gosh, the very first question we. <laughs> And today's episode was about how, you know, we are not making a lot of money in this sector. So you're already coming to the table with somebody who's probably right you know, fragile and, economically. And, and, you know, here's the other part of that, whether or not, you know, the individual is fragile or not, I don't think necessarily is the focus. The focus is I'm being compensated at this level to do this particular job, yeah. but I did not sign on for these additional fiscal responsibilities Yeah, because, you know, then, right. you, then you're infringing on my monthly budget. So mm -hmm. it's really important, but I think your suggestion is spot on, you know, with those prepaid cards for the different restaurants and or the Visa MasterCards, and then you just supply the detailed receipt yeah, after it's receipt. been used. And that helps with the reconciliation process. And that is a win-win for everyone. Right, I agree. Okay, well, hopefully that straightened that thing out because that's <laughs> dreadful. That that's just dreadful. Um, I think we've been, I think we've had that question maybe once before, but I think what's happened too, LaShonda, is you know, people are getting out. People, you know, yes. during the pandemic, it wasn't that big of a deal because people were just, you know, trying to get Zoom appointments, right? Right. And maybe having lunch delivered or, you know, something like that to be a little creative. But yeah, people were going out. Okay, this is interesting. Frustrated grant writer from St. Louis, Missouri writes in, I'm a grant writer and I have a CEO who just told me to apply for as many grants as I can, even though the organization not be may not be covering the type of programming called for in the grant application. Can you help me here? I need to explain why this is a mistake and costly at that. Wow. So yeah. Julia, you have had some very interesting writers um, <laughs> this week and um, do <laughs> understand frustrated grant writer. You are not alone. No. Uh, you know, we started off talking about linkage, ability, interest, and doing all of the pre-work. Um, and the same thing happens when you're looking for grants. You want to make sure that there is an alignment with programs and services that you currently offer, because they may ask you questions about, you know, what have been some of the um, implications of your work? What are the imp What is the impact? And if you don't have that content, you know, you're starting to fill out this application, you've gone through all of these processes, and then for not, and it's it's truly not a good waste, a good way to use your resources because not only um, is it costly from your time, it is costly from a financial standpoint, and it's also costly from personnel because you can literally be spending time um, putting together a quality proposal for uh, a grant that aligns with your organization. Um, so I would say that you would probably need to kind of give an overview to um, to the individual about grants and how the process works, because sometimes, you know, the, the challenge is a lack of knowledge. So yeah. going through actually one of the applications and kind of talking through the process and how grants work and how we can't just make up a new program today that we don't have people in place to actually uh, facilitate mm. Um, the programming, um, you know, if, it, if it's an expansion of an existing program, I can understand that. However, to just offspring and say, we're going to start this new program just because this particular foundation is offering a grant, I don't think would uh, be justice to your organization, especially if that particular programming has nothing to do with the current services that you provide. If it's, it's not an extension or doesn't complement what you're doing, then unfortunately, it's just not a good fit. And so um, I'd say do your due diligence and provide some background information on grants and the processes. Right. And, you know, my, my, my first thought was, you know, this is more than a number scheme. Mm -hmm. Only about 30%, I mean, if you're successful, about 30% of, of all the grant applications you make are going to result in what they call a grant win. So you need to understand kind of like what that looks like for the amount of work and the amount of money, whether you're paying an outside grant writer or an internal one, it still costs money, right? Um, and so you have to be more strategic. 
it's it's ridiculous to just be like throwing the spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, right? Or gumbo. You're putting everything in the pot. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. That's fabulous. Well, hey, we don't have much time left. And I didn't want to leave um, this this uh, Good Friday, and it has been a Good Friday, um, with you, LaShonda. We kind of teased this at the beginning, but as we speak today, there are really only less than two dozen tickets left to cultivate. It sold out last year. Talk to us about what goes on and, and what to expect to cultivate. So Cultivate 2024 is the conference that you don't want to miss. We're very excited, Julia, as you said, we've got less than two dozen tickets left. Uh, we'll talk about ways to cultivate knowledge, relationships and impact. We have speakers from across the US. We're very excited to offer 18 sessions that will be very intense. Um, some of them will also include opportunities for real-time action planning. Uh, we'll have networking opportunities. And most importantly, we will have the opportunity for everyone who is present to be able to be a part of something unique, something different. Uh, we've lined up our keynote and our plenary speakers. And if you want to know who they are, you'll have to go to our website because I'm teasing just a little bit more. Uh, but we have phenomenal folks. Like when I say phenomenal, mm -hmm. we're very, very excited. We just released it on um, LinkedIn and on um, Instagram, all the social media earlier this week. And we are looking forward to engaging everyone who is present to help them amplify their cause and most importantly, provide them with some useful tools that they can use immediately. Upon the conclusion of the conference, you will have information that you can apply in real time. This isn't something that you have to think about and yeah. ponder over. You're going to be ready and equipped yeah. to go full throttle the next day. All of our topics are encompassing things that are current trends so that you'll be um, very knowledgeable of things that are currently happening. We have some information on AI. We have information on metrics because we're always talking about metrics. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, we mentioned earlier the donor centric um, concept. Mm -hmm. So there is a variety for everyone. We have something for executive leadership. We have some things for those in that middle space. And then for those that are newcomers. And just in case, if you're not sure where you fall in the spectrum or where you want to be, you can create your own schedule and um, be able to kind of sample some of the different things that you feel like you need specifically so that you can grow as a professional. So we are looking forward to cultivating relationships, impact, and knowledge uh, this year for the second year in sunny San Diego to uh, a day and a half of very um, enlightening and um, amplified ways to um, increase your fun raising abilities. I love it. Now, let me ask you one quick question before we go. Do you have to be a professional fundraiser or could you be a CEO or CFO or even in you can be a CEO, a CFO? There is okay. something for everyone. Okay. Um, when we pull together the um the schedule we wanted to make sure that we could address everyone so okay. for the novice or for someone who may even be interested in transitioning into the fundraising space okay. so we have something on every level um whether you're the expert or whether you're the novice and you're just kind of muddling your way through we uh wanted we were intentional with okay. making sure that we had something for everyone and i think that's why we're less than two dozen tickets away I'm just like stunned. Well, we will be there. The nonprofit show will be broadcasting there um, from live from uh, from San Diego um, on that Friday. So come by where you'll see us set up and introduce yourself. And who knows, maybe we'll even get you on the show. Um, LaShonda, thanks. We I, I got to believe that this is going to be sold out by mid yes and the next I'm, week. I'm thinking I'm thinking over the weekend Julia because yeah. everyone that's listening right now is going to the website mm -hmm. and once they see our um our keynote and our plenary that is going to completely seal the deal we have a dynamic lineup of speakers again from across the country whose areas of expertise um are wide range um in fundraising something definitely for everyone I love it well LaShonda Williams MPA, CFRE, one of the great trainers, and I always say one of the great minds from Fundraising Academy. You're always a joy to be with. 
check out the work that Fundraising Academy at National University does at fundraising-academy.org. The majority, the majority of their site has free content. And it is astonishing what you can learn for yourself independently, for your team, and for your organization. Um, I can't recommend them enough. It's just an amazing, amazing place of knowledge. And again, another amazing part of what we get to see each and every day here at the Nonprofit Show is the support of our sponsors. They are truly remarkable. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Hey, my friend, have a wonderful, safe, and blessed holiday weekend. Thank you, and you too. And I'm looking forward to seeing the weeks. I know, it'll be a lot of fun. Everybody, as we end each episode of the Nonprofit Show, we like to leave with this message, and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, LaShonda. 